it's, it's not a problem. Uh, we decided to manage it in English uh, since uh, there are many people also from, uh, let's say, digitally uh, looking the, the event, uh, uh, since uh, also our host, uh, let's say, have a, a role at international level. Uh, we have a couple of, uh, we, we had a couple of issues with uh, our moderator and one of the speaker, uh, Sergio Barbarino, which is looking uh, us at the moment, has been blocked uh, for the COVID, uh, let's say, restriction from, from his company. Uh, and uh, the other speaker is blocked in Austria for, for a personal issue. But uh, uh, we are big enough to manage the, the event, uh, and I hope uh, that we will be able to, uh, to solve all your problems uh, and, and, and all the issues. So thanks once again to be here with us. Uh, and uh, uh, I saw that the previous, the previous event uh, was uh, incredibly interesting. And also the questions were super vertical and super pertinent to the, to the topic. So I really hope that uh, uh, also this session will uh, stimulate you in, uh, in, uh, with your questions, with your doubts, uh, and so on. We will try to, to deep a little bit a concept uh, which is uh, uh, very common today, which is the concept of the zero emissions, uh, obviously related to the, to the transport. Um, and as and, and said, uh, since we don't have the moderator, I will be both moderator and speaker. So I, I will speak a little bit uh, too much, uh, but uh, I will try to be, to be not funny, but <laughs> I hope interesting. Um, I'm Andrea Condotta, Public Affairs Innovation Manager in, uh, in Gruber Logistics. So going to the topic, as I said, uh, zero uh, emissions. In, in many cases, this uh, statement uh, uh, has uh, had a great value for, for marketing, but it's, it's, um, it's a topic that needs to be uh, dived in order to clearly understand what zero emissions means. Normally, in the past, a couple of years ago, uh, just a couple of years ago, we, we, just, we were just focused on the topic, uh, or, or at least it was super normal speaking about it, the topic, uh, looking at just uh, the final phase of the transport. So in, uh, technically, we speak uh, of uh, uh, tank-to-wheel uh, perception, tank-to-wheel analysis. It means that I'm in a refueling station, I put the fuel in, in my truck, in my car, I use it, uh, and, and that's, uh, uh, that means tank to wheel. So it's a phase uh, of calculation. Nowadays, this is not uh, sufficient anymore. So uh, we are exploiting, uh, analyzing uh, all the phase uh, of, uh, of the usage of the fuel. So it means that right now, we consider the production phase as well as uh, the, um, uh, the final step. So technically, we add uh, to the tank to wheel analysis, the well to tank analysis. And when we speak about the factors of emission, normally we say uh, well to wheel. So that, that's the focus. So when we speak about uh, zero emission, this should be the base. When in the previous panel they said uh, just one year ago, everyone could say um, electric is, is the future is that basically they were just considering the tank to wheel analysis. So saying that uh, uh, the, the electric was zero emission if you consider just the final step, but it's not zero emission if you're considering all, all the chain. Uh, by the way, I would say that the electric is not so bad. <laughs> I mean that uh, uh, in, 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 the previous, uh, in the previous panel, it seems that uh, uh, discovering that we need to, to, to analyze all the chain, uh, there was in a way uh, the idea that the electric is, is, is really bad. But it, in, indeed, it's not. We need proper analysis for all kind of fuels that we want to use. The, the positive aspect uh, is that uh, right now we, don't, we are not linked to just one, uh, one fuels. Uh, we have different possibilities, different fuels, uh, even if uh, we consider uh, my segment of the logistics, which is uh, mostly related to the long run and, and uh, uh, heavy transport. It means uh, 40 tons vehicle, which is probably the most difficult part of the logistic chain to decarbonize. 
if I have to consider the different fuels that we have available at the moment, uh, uh, let's say that uh, five, six years uh, ago, it was all diesel. Right now you have methane, you have liquefied methane, you have uh, bio-liquefied metal as well as uh, biogas. Uh, it depends on the distances that you want to cover. And right now we are also approaching the next step of evolution of the technology, which is uh, uh, electric as well as hydrogen. There is a question mark that we need to face. So it's really possible to speak about zero emissions. And uh, taking into account what I have already said, we need to exploit the topic with data, considering the, the, the real data and the and all chain of, uh, of analysis. Um, I would say that uh, my answer is yes, it's possible. Uh, there are solutions also right now that can support the idea of, uh, of, of zero emission. Uh, what is difficult is to achieve a deployment phase. Uh, what is difficult is to provide such solutions uh, in a, in a wider range uh, to, to make it uh, possible for everyone. Um, I would say that uh, if I can uh, describe uh, um, very briefly which are the tools that we have at the moment uh, on our hands in order to decarbonize the logistics chain, we need to take in consideration three main possibilities. The first one is uh, alternative fuels, uh, which is the topic that has been exploited uh, and deep also in the previous panel, and we will do it uh, also in this one. The second uh, uh, really important uh, aspect uh, is uh, intermodality, so the usage of different modes of transport than, uh, than the road. And the third one uh, is uh, the full exploitation of the capacity of the transport that we have. Uh, in, particular, the, uh, in particular, we will uh, exploit, we will consider um, most uh, the alternative fuels uh, and intermodality, but uh, I will touch also the point of the full um, exploitation of the capacity of, uh, of the transport network. Uh, but uh, I, I, I'm my pleasure to go to Paolo Carri. Uh, from, uh, from Scania, uh, and uh, I will ask to Paolo to, uh, to spend some words about the electric, since, uh, as I said, uh, uh, there are certainly some limits for the electric, uh, as, been, uh, as, as was uh, highlighted, um, but uh, I would say that uh, any kind of solution, especially if we speak about innovation, you can face, uh, you can face difficulties. And the reason is that if you go to diesel, it's a normal one. So it's a, it's a um, solution that it's available since decades. Uh, there is a full infrastructure, um, technologies that can work properly, and so on. If we switch uh, to another solution that can be, as I said, uh, gas, biomethan, uh, and so on, uh, hydrogen, uh, electric, uh, we need to create a different system. It's a sector that needs to move in another direction. Um, so, Paolo. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, let's speak about uh, uh, a little bit more about the electric and, and which is your approach and your analysis on the framework. Thank you, Drea, and, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. If I may take a small step back, I would say, uh, I mean, we understood the goal is not just to be a friend of the environment. The goal is to be sustainable in an environmental and economical way. And, and, uh, it is a big, big challenge, and it is uh, too complex uh, to be faced with just one technology, and it is uh, too urgent to wait for a silver bullet for a new technology to be ready and available to everyone. I think that in the discussion, there is a, a dimension which is sort of missing, which is the time dimension. I would say that uh, sustainability or sustainable transport is not uh, the destination, is rather the journey, because it's, it's really crucial what we do in the next decades, and we cannot really afford to think to electric, hydrogen only, so in this perspective, I think it should be also read and, uh, and, uh, and understood what was said in the previous uh, uh, panel. So, truck manufacturers like Scania, we are, are active in the so-called heavy-duty vehicle range above 16 tons, have 
to work and think every day uh, for the future and for the present. And Andrea, I think that uh, uh, you mentioned three uh, pillars and uh, we as Scania share a similar vision, as you would said before, we work with uh, energy efficiency. We uh, don't feel ashamed saying that we have to develop the internal combustion engine because it will be with us for many years to come. We work on energy efficiency also working with drivers. A good driver can make a tremendous difference, can save up to 15% of fuel. And then, as you said, working on uh, uh, renewable fuels, it's really a great opportunity for today. And uh, uh, biomethane was mentioned, it is definitely in Italy um, the most important opportunity. There was a far uh, seeing uh, um, decree, the biomethane decree of uh, 2018, which started up all the, the chain of supply of, uh, of biomethane. And we do have the product since many years to, to work on, on biomethane. Now coming to electrification. Electrification itself, it's a journey because under the name uh, uh, goods transport lay a huge variety of application, many different use cases for, uh, with different needs, such as power, big trucks, small trucks, uh, uh, driving range, uh, and uh, also more uh, structural needs like dimension, weight, uh, uh, and so on. And uh, electrification, in our vision, will uh, we'll start now, because as it was said, we have launched, I mean, you can go by a Scania dealer, for instance, our dealer in Parma, and order um, uh, an electric truck. And, um, and this truck today will be a, a truck for uh, urban application, working around the city where you can have the charging infrastructure at hand, and uh, along the decade, we foresee that uh, in 2030, we'll get to some point around 50, 60% of new sales of uh, electrified uh, trucks. More or less in the middle of the decade, uh, also long haulage truck like uh, yours, Andrea, uh, will have the possibility to, to be electrified. And uh, I see that many of you were present before and uh, the question on charging was, was made. Uh, let me mention that. Now, at the beginning, charging points will be mostly at the truck's depot to be charged during the night, so we have time to do it, and for instance, a destination. When we move outside the city and we go uh, to, to the long haul, it will be crucial to have charging infrastructure and route, so-called, along the highways. And this charging infrastructure is different uh, than those uh, of the cars. And everybody understands that you cannot wait eight hours. Because, I mean, the truck has to, to drive and transport goods. And, but maybe not all of you know that a truck must stop during the day. Because there is a law about driving time. And after 5.5 hours of driving, the truck must stop and rest for uh, 45 minutes. In our model, uh, after that time, or in that time, when the, the, the driver is resting, maybe having lunch, if we have a charger big enough, you can recharge the batteries and then drive the second half of the day. Those chargers are high power chargers. They, to, to reach that, uh, we, can, we can talk about numbers. To do that model, you have to have on the truck uh, something like uh, 600 kilowatt hours of energy stored. You can charge that energy in 45 minutes if you have what we call a me megawatt uh, charges, so up to uh, 1,000 kilowatt power. We don't have those charges today. But a news of just four days ago was the announcement of a memorandum of understanding signed by Trayton, which is the group that Scania belongs to, Daimler, read Mercedes, and Volvo. 
they have invested 500 million euro to start building in a crucial country in Europe to start with 1,700 of those charging points. To start the process, they have invested, and this is also partial answer to the question who has to pay the transition. Well, uh, the manufacturer have to invest, and now they are coming in a new field like supporting in this way uh, the, the charging infrastructure, because as you said, Andrea, is a system evolution, it's not just a, a, a new product. If I may conclude this, uh, since we talk about, and you talk about, uh, where to will, and I mean, this panel has a title, Zero Emission. I mean, we believe we should go away from the rhetoric of uh, zero emission and start talking about the real numbers. And when you don't compare any more internal combustion vehicle like uh, diesel with gas, and you start talking about electric vehicles, you have to consider a life cycle approach with the production and with the final recovery. And uh, Scania has just published, it, it is public, you can download it from, from the internet, uh, a life cycle analysis comparing a diesel truck, I mean, a Scania truck with the chassis number, uh, with uh, one of our first BEV, uh, battery electric trucks. This study, this comparison is done according to a ISO standard. The ISO standard is 14,040, uh, 14, and it's validated from, by an external entity. And the uh, start puts number. If we consider the old cycle, and uh, in a conservative way, batteries are not assumed or considered to have a second life, uh, but they are just recovered. Uh, I mean, the raw material is just recovered by grinding the, the battery. The result is that if we plug that truck in the uh, average uh, European mix of electricity of all different sources, the improvement in CO2 emission is 38%. And if we plug this truck on a fully um, wind energy, that number goes up to 86. So it's not zero, it's not 100, it's 38 average uh, European, 86. And this number can improve, can improve and will improve when we really start to have a critical mass, we have a second life for the batteries, and also will improve when we have, when we will have uh, for instance, more sustainable steel. And when we talk uh, about hydrogen, for instance, we believe hydrogen will be crucial to have sustainable steel. So these are the numbers that we see, and uh, we work a lot for the present, uh, but this is what we see in the future. Electrification will be needed. Will be needed because of uh, its efficiency, will be needed because the all electrical energy production will have to go towards renewable sources because energy, electrical energy is needed in all industry, not only in transport. So thanks for, for clarifying the aspect. Uh, since uh, uh, I would say that in, in general, when we speak about innovation, we have, uh, in, in any kind of innovation, we have a period in which it seems that uh, uh, something is getting in the market and will change everything. And so we are super happy that everything will change, everything will be solved. Then there is, a, a, let's say, a, a curve that go to the reality, and then we, need, we start to analyze the innovation step by step, uh, and, and, and we, we start really to understand how that kind of innovation can improve our life, uh, our system, and economy, and so on. Uh, so personally, staying also on, on what you have uh, uh, done in terms of critical analysis of the electric, I would say that uh, uh, the electric will give us uh, uh, certainly an improvement of the system that we have right now, uh, but we will not have zero emissions, let's say. At least in the first, day, in the, in the first stage, I mean, uh, it's a system, as we said, to build, uh, having second life of the battery, having a, a better energy mix uh, for, for the transport uh, will certainly decrease and decrease, decrease uh, the emissions factor. 
in my introduction, I, I touch another point, which is uh, uh, the marketing. So uh, I would say that uh, some, some years ago, there were basically no one speaking about uh, sustainability, or, or there were just few initiatives speaking about uh, sustainability. Now we are in a phase uh, in which everyone needs to speak about sustainability. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we are doing sustainability. Uh, it means that uh, there are a lot of different people that speak about it. Uh, all the companies need to speak about it. Uh, but it's important to uh, define clear strategy and to provide a real fact of what we are doing. Uh, Electrolux uh, is, uh, is, is a company that is really in doing something practically. And uh, when, when you speak about a long-term strategy, I know that there is a list of actions that you, that you need to implement. That, that's very important, because the risk is that when companies say, we will be neutral in 2050, they will wait till 2049 to start to do something. So it, it's good to know which is the strategy, and it's good to know uh, which are the facts. So starting from the strategy of Electrolux, uh, I would love to know something more about uh, your approach. Uh, so Marcelo Marcal, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction, Andrea. And uh, again, I'm very pleased to, to be here and uh, share this moment with you because the uh, decarbonization is uh, a serious matter that we treat internally at uh, Electrolux. And, uh, I just have the pleasure to share what many other colleagues are doing and supporting us. And yes, for those who are not familiar with Electrolux, we are a more than 100 years old company, actually this year, 101. Uh, it started by the innovation, so the vacuum cleaner that you use at your house was an innovation of Electrolux, and, uh, but that started many years ago. Uh, we have a, a purpose as, as a company, and our purpose is shape live for the better. If you go to our website, you will realize that. And we really mean that. We have basically three strategic drivers in, in our company. One is act sustainable. The second one is create better experiences. And the third one is always improve. So what we try is, in each one of these strategic drivers, we try to build our strategies with our teams and uh, address the, the point that we're discussing now on sustainability. Um, sustainability at Electrolux, uh, in terms of measurement, started many years ago, I would say at least 12 years ago. Uh, but in terms of real actions, uh, it, it did not start with the purpose of sustainability. It started because of other issues, operational issues. But then in the last years, we realized that we could do much more if we just have the right strategy. In, so the, the point of the panel today is, is zero emissions possible? I would, I, would, I would like to start saying by yes, it's possible. Is it difficult? Yes, is it, it's very difficult. But I think if we, we work together and if we collaborate not only the end users, because we are the end users, uh, but with the transportation companies, with the truck manufacturers, with the government, and other external associations, we can make it happen. Uh, I collaborate in other associations like the European Commission, uh, the World Economic Forum, and other uh, small groups that I try to collaborate and participate, and we are always ex exchanging ideas. But if I share what we are trying to do, we started by having a clear strategy in terms of transport, transport mode at Electrolux and the ambitions. So we set targets for the next five years, for the next 10 years, and for the next 20 years. If I look at the company strategy or target in terms of reducing emissions in operations, we have a target by 2025 to reduce 80% of, of emissions or CO2, just to, to keep it simple. Today, 2021, I can say that we are already at 71% and our baseline is 2015. I think also in the previous panel, there was a, a similar approach, 2015 as a starting point. So today we hear in, in terms of operations, 71% already reduced. If we look at the transportation, mainly, mainly I'm talking about the distribution of our goods. We have reduced since 2015 
24% of emissions. And in terms of uh, uh, renewable energy, as we, we were also talking about that, this year, I mean, last year, 2020, 50% of the energy that we use in our operations came from renewable sources. So that gives a flavor of, of what we are doing internally. But this most, most important point is, when you do this type of strategy, you need to, to analyze what you have available. So we started concentrating mainly on the train part, which is so far the most reliable and, and, the, and the clean source. But we said it's not enough. We need to start looking of other uh, alternatives, other vehicles, and start testing them. Because one thing is to declare in a paper, okay, this type of uh, technology reduces CO2. The other thing is doing the real test. And we, we've been attempting to do that in the last three years. I would say that we are really engaged. So just to give you a, a small example, if, the, if I tell you that the combined mode of uh, intermodal and rail was in the range of 18% three years ago, this year we are in the running rate of 44%. So 44% of our distribution, everything that we are shipping out of our factories, are going either in rail or intermodal. And we have the ambition to extend that much more in the next years because we truly believe that this is probably the most sustainable way of transporting goods. But we, we, we rely also on our uh, transportation suppliers. So we cannot, we know that it's impossible to not depend only on road. What we need and what we expect to have from the, the, the OEMs and also the, the, the carriers that are buying the trucks is that they migrate from the, for, for better technologies like the hydrogens, electric, and LNG and BioLNG. And we are really uh, excited because we started this journey three years ago. We have done tests in probably all of the technologies. The only one that we are missing is hydrogen. So it's kind of if you have a, a vehicle you want to test, we, we can test. Uh, but we are, we are very happy about that because the results are coming. And the more we do, we see that there is a real appeal internally in our employees and also on the external. And people are invited, myself and my colleagues, to participate in other events just to understand what are you guys doing. But it's not easy. It requires planning. It requires uh, uh, cost analysis because uh, some technologies that are just coming, they are very expensive. But we need to find a business case. And most recently, we approved in our long-term budget uh, a money to, to dedicate just to test new technologies in terms of cleaner transportation. Um, I'm going to be, during the panel here, available for other specific questions if you have. And again, I'm very happy to, to share our experience here with you today. Thanks. Well. well um you, you touched the topic of hydrogen. Since uh, I introduced the, 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 let's say, the idea of the curve of the technology in, in which you, we wait for the innovation and we wait for the true innovation that will change uh, everything. Uh, so I, I will ask you our technology provider uh, to touch uh, the topic of hydrogen. Since uh, uh, it's true that hydrogen will be interesting, will be a certainly interesting technology if you, if you come to, to, to Gruber Logistics uh, and ask, do you want to try uh, a, a hydrogen truck? Uh, is yes, immediately. Uh, but it's also true that we need to analyze also that kind of technology, even if uh, it, it's not ready yet. Um, it's coming to, to the market, let's say, in a few years. But um, let's go in deep in it. Uh, it's uh, really the final solution of all our problems. Well, uh, that's, a, that's a difficult question. And, and, and definitely hydrogen is a very interesting topic uh, and there are a lot of talks about hydrogen uh, today. Uh, we can maybe, I, I don't want to be too academic, but I think it's worth uh, setting a bit the, the floor uh, about hydrogen. I mean, um, 
hydrogen is not a primary source of energy, right? Hydrogen must be made, and there are many, many ways to make, to make hydrogen. Some of them are sustainable, some of them in terms of uh, decarbonization, some others are not. And uh, almost 100% of the hydrogen we make today is, make, is made in a non-sustainable way. Uh, it's so-called gray hydrogen, uh, by, done by steam reforming from hydrocarbons. Uh, when we talk about hydrogen for sustainable transport, we normally refer to green hydrogen, which is made by um, electrolysis and uses uh, electrical energy to start with. The uh, hydrogen vehicle, which is in, 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 in almost, when we normally talk about hydrogen vehicle, we refer to a fuel cell vehicle. And this is an electric vehicle. In, in our world, is an electric truck with a bit smaller batteries, okay, and uh, a, a, a hydrogen tank and, and a fuel cell, okay. So the situation today is that uh, we basically, as we said, do not have green hydrogen, but there are plans, there are big investments, and let's assume that uh, there will be green hydrogen. Second problem today is that the fuel cell technology is very expensive. It's not mature. Despite it was used in the uh, Apollo uh, mission in the 1960s to generate uh, uh, electricity, and you have seen, if you have seen uh, Apollo 13, the film, uh, you, will, you will remember. It's, and if you have not, uh, you should see it. It's a very nice film. Uh, but today, still, despite it's so old, the technology is not mature, it's not uh, economically sustainable. But in our, uh, in our forecast, the, the price will go down. So let's assume that uh, at a certain point, uh, uh, fuel cell, a fuel cell truck with smaller batteries and the fuel cell technology will cost the same as a battery electrical vehicle which does not have the will uh, get 75 energy turn into energy. economy, good, will not be competitive. So when you have a two sustainable solutions and one of them has a better total operating economy, 
that is the one that will win. So this is the point why we believe that uh, there will be uh, a hydrogen economy. And by the way, the only steelworks, okay, Industria Siderurgica, will require more of the hydrogen visit that is for a sea to be produced in 2030. Only that sector, which is one also called hard to abate, right? So that is another challenge. But in the end, we will think that the problem will be the total operating economy. There will be niches that could be specific truck application or geographies where we will have a minor weight of the transportation, for instance, of, uh, of uh, hydrogen. Well, where hydrogen can be competitive, but in our vision will not be competitive on most of the transport. And since there is, and now I finish, the, the, the common uh, saying that uh, uh, hydrogen will be for long distances, well, I tell you, with long distances, you need more energy. A truck is much more expensive to fuel than to buy. Okay, and, and when, where you need much more energy, there hydrogen will be less competitive for the reason I said before. Of course, this thinking lays on the assumption that we can have both a battery electric uh, charging infrastructure, those big megawatt uh, charging system that I mentioned before, and on the other side, uh, the, the, the pumps of hydrogen. Uh, if we can have the both, then the comparison that I tried, hopefully, uh, to explain will, uh, will, uh, will be valid. And the conclusion is, according to our vision, the ones I said. Um, I, will stay, I will stay with you for, for another question. Um, well, I, I said that you cannot go on the market right now and, and buy an, an hydrogen truck. Let's say that there are different providers that at the moment uh, are in a way proposing it on the market as a future solution. But it's also true that uh, right now in Switzerland there is a big test of hydrogen trucks uh, that can go 400 kilometers. Uh, they are not uh, the trucks that we normally use for the transports, as I said, that normally we are on the 40 tons truck uh, and they're, uh, if I'm not wrong, is uh, 12 ton trucks or something like that. So smaller than the ones that we normally use. By the way, my, my question is, uh, um, in terms of emissions, uh, it, it's clear to me your view in terms of uh, the cost, uh, the operational capacity for those trucks to get in the market. But my question is, uh, in terms of emissions, do we have uh, a clear view on, uh, on the emission of hydrogen? It's actually, we don't have the possibility, the real possibility to verify the emissions on the field. Well, I think I should answer by, uh, what I said before, we should make a life cycle analysis on hydrogen, considering uh, uh, the, all the materials that we use uh, for a hydrogen truck compared with a battery, electrical vehicle, and then also the recovery phase. This we have not done, and this we cannot say. Uh, in the conclusion, we cannot uh, say at the moment. Uh, I think, uh, Andrea, that uh, we should come back to the point that both for battery electric vehicles and for a, a green hydrogen vehicle, let's call them in this way, the difference will be made by the, by the way electricity is made. Because uh, this is a very interesting point. I was uh, listening to Marcelo uh, about the sustainability targets and they are, I mean, 80% is a lot. So, I mean, congratulations. Uh, in our industry, uh, the overall emission, if we take the overall emissions and we say, let's say 100, our, the overall emission that our products make is 100. Of these 100, more than 95, or approximately 95, comes from the use phase, okay? What is normally called scope three. So during the use of the truck, the years they drive on the road, the kilometers that they drive on the road. So we also have 
uh, uh, scope one and two goals about our production, but we have a uh, target uh, certified by science-based targets on our scope three, so, so the use phase. And, uh, and this is a reduction of 20% of these emissions in 2025 compared with 2015. And this, believe me, is really challenging. And if I can then come back to the, 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 my initial point, uh, we need all technologies to reach, that, uh, to reach that goal. We cannot just rely on electrification. We cannot just rely to alternative fuel. We need electrification. We need biomethane. We also need the most efficient diesel truck today because only if we put all those components together, we may have a chance, and hopefully we will, to reach this goal. Thanks. Uh, well, uh, you touched a very important point, which is uh, that we need a, a multiply solutions uh, system, and, uh, and, and that's basically what we think in Gruber Logistics. Uh, um, we are a company which is spread all around Europe. Uh, you, most of you probably d don't know us uh, since we are not a company that come to your house with a pack. Uh, so we are more in, in the business to business uh, framework. But we have 35 branches spread uh, all around Europe. Uh, and uh, we have trains going around. Uh, we, we transport by rail, we transport by airplane, ship, uh, and so on. Um, well, uh, uh, we, we spoke about strategy, we spoke about technology, but uh, we also said that uh, we love to speak about facts. So how uh, companies like us uh, are, are facing in, uh, in practically the topic of, uh, of sustainability. Uh, well, uh, I need to mention that uh, we are in a sector with a, a very low level of marginality. Uh, from some comments of the previous panel, we have seen that uh, there is a problem of the economical sustainability of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the environmental sustainability itself. But it's also true that uh, with an effort, uh, with uh, proposing the right solutions with the, uh, to, to the customer, to, uh, to your partner, you can, you can make great, great steps forward. To, to, just to make some example, um, um, in the previous panel, uh, they said that the average uh, of the vehicles uh, is more or less 24 years old. We have 500 trucks uh, right now running, uh, and the average uh, uh, of, uh, of the age of our truck uh, is uh, three years. So it's not possible to move forward to a more sustainable solution. 100 of those trucks uh, are LNG, so they are going to liquid uh, methane. 50 trucks uh, are going biodiesel, so it means diesel, but done by biomasses. And uh, recently, we have launched uh, a great project in the, in the Brenner Corridor based on, uh, on the bio-LNG, which is something that we have uh, mentioned today. And uh, in, in the Brenner Corridor, we have, let's say, the first plant in Europe uh, in which you can find poor bio-LNG. What's the poor bio-LNG? What does it mean? It means that uh, um, we have um, biomethane liquefied in a specific plant, so it's not mixed, and it comes from uh, advanced biomasses. Just to, just to make a step. Um, when we consider the, the well-to-wheel analysis, we'd also to say that uh, where we take uh, the biomasses. Just to make an example, I could cut a forest and, and produce biomasses for, for the vehicle and say, that's great, I have reduced the emissions, but actually my, the production of, my, my, of, of my biomasses is not really sustainable. In our cases, we are producing the, the fuel from the waste of, of agricultural production. Uh, we are preventing the methane going uh, in, in the atmosphere. We are taking that uh, methane and doing uh, uh, biofuel. Um, we liquefied it. Why it is liquefied? Because we need to do many kilometers. So in, in, in the gas form, uh, we could do around 700 kilometers with our truck. In a liquefied form, we can do 1,500 kilometers, more or less, something less, let's say. But uh, we can do enough uh, in order to manage uh, uh, long-distance transport. Uh, th that's a very important thing, since uh, uh, if we consider the whole process of the production of fuel here in this moment, uh, 
we can have uh, minus 95% uh, of emission with this methodology on transport. And this is something more. It's minus 95%, and we are not considering also the methane that we are preventing going to the atmosphere. So we are basically neutral from, uh, from the emissions point of view. Obviously, we said that when we speak about new things, new technologies going in the market, uh, nothing is perfect. So also in this case, uh, we need to say that uh, the production of uh, BioLNG in Italy, it's super low, as well as in the other countries of Europe. It means that Italy is one of the, of the main important uh, countries producing bio, bio LNG, but as I said, the production is, uh, is incredibly low. In other countries, uh, there is no production at all, and the technology is coming and is arriving. Uh, is this the solution for the future? The answer is again, no. This is not for, for everything. We could decarbonize some specific lanes of the transport. We cannot decarbonize everything since uh, we don't have waste of production of agriculture and farms to produce an uh, uh, um, infinitive quantity of, of bio LNG. But it's, in my view, it's in any case a very important message. Uh, if we, right now, if we consider the idea to, to have a zero emission transport, this is possible with the technology that we have right now. According to our objective, we still have time in order to uh, decrease the transport and to reach the objective that we have, uh, but it's important to have this, this, this fact on the table, let's say. Um, I would love to jump to, to, the, to the other topic uh, with, uh, with Marcelo, which is the intermodality. This is also a very important topic, uh, as we said, uh, and not fully exploited as, as, uh, as, we, as we think, since uh, uh, it's not so easy to, to go to intermodal. It means that if you have a truck, you can move a truck all around. You don't need to have a perfect balance round trip, let's say. It means that if you have a transfer from A to B, you go, you load, you unload, and that you can go in other places, loading and unloading and so on before coming back. In the framework of intermodality, the issue is that you have uh, to have a, uh, you, you have to have a perfect balance going in the direction and coming back. Otherwise, the cost uh, and operationally, it's uh, really, really difficult. Um, but Electrolux realized it, uh, as Marcelo said, in many places they have intermodal flows. Uh, so also I guess that in this case, it, it, it's possible. But uh, I'm, I'm wondering how difficult it was to realize it uh, and how is the situation right now? Thank you, Andrea. Um, well, I mentioned before that uh, if we take intermodality alone, we went from 11% three years ago to 33% at the end of last year. And if I combine with the other 14% that we have on RAE, so 47% should be the, 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 the running uh, rate for us by the end of this year. But we are actually facing a problem because uh, the economy is, is, is growing. And uh, we uh, lately are using much more road than, than we wish to, to use. But even if you want to go this 47% or beyond this 47%, uh, we need to understand here and, and for the people that, that are listening to us that if you want to take a train, you can go from anywhere, from Parma to anywhere in Europe. But if you want to, to put a trailer or a container, it's not that simple. You need to have the right stations, I mean, the, the, the right hubs to, 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 to load, unload. You need to invest in the vehicles, in the trailers, mainly. Uh, but it's not that easy to, to have these right connections because most of the time you have hubs, you have uh, distribution centers all over the place in order to connect this, these places to the right uh, train setup, it's very difficult. Uh, we, we are really facing the, the problem of infrastructure and also the problem that uh, the rail network is in, in, in the hands of a few, a few, few uh, countries or a few organizations. So you really need to have your carriers investing and buying the, the possibility of using these lanes so you can expand more intermodality. And not many, many companies have that ability today. Uh, Gruber is one of them that, that has, luckily. Uh, but we want to expand more. But it's been a real challenge lately. We, we went from here to here, 
but to, to go beyond, it's, it's becoming uh, a problem of infrastructure. Um, I hope that the, the other associations, the government then can give incentives uh, for the rail, but not the, the pure transport, passenger transport, but also industrial transportation as to support this uh, movement to grow even more. Um, uh, for instance, I can give an example. Because of the recovery of economy, many companies that are ordering trailers to be used for the intermodality, we're not getting the trailers. We are not getting the trucks. So there is a, a real issue in the moment, but I assume in a couple of years this will be fixed. But long term, I think that the connections and uh, the possibilities to use this rail network uh, needs to be taken more seriously if we want to, to grow and, and expand. Again, it's not easy. We are realizing that now that uh, we, we move it fast, but now to, to move, move faster, we need help from outside. We cannot do it alone. Uh, th that's a very important point that uh, if, uh, when we move towards this kind of innovations, uh, uh, we need to work uh, as a system. Otherwise, uh, it will not work. I mean that in, in the past, uh, you go in the market, you buy something, and you're happy about, uh, about that. Um, when a company like Electrolux, when a company like Bubble Logistics move towards uh, intermodality, they need to change basically everything. Also in terms of forecast, uh, Electrolux need to be very precise. Since uh, if you go by truck, if you don't use the truck for that specific lane, you go to another part. If you use uh, a fixed lane, it's not just a fixed direction, it's also a fixed uh, quantity of volumes. And if you don't use them, you pay them in, uh, in any case. Um, I, I, would, I would love also to jump to, to Electrolux once more, uh, since you said that you have tried different fuels, you have tried different solutions, uh, uh, and you are testing, uh, you're ready to test even hydrogen and, and, and new technologies going in the market. Uh, what you're using right now? What are the solutions that you think that are more reliable, that uh, you are uh, already doing, the, doing practically? Good question. If, if we look only at the alternative fuels, um, for instance, I can speak about electric because we have two running projects today. One in the pure distribution, so it's a small radius around 35 kilometers, and the second, it's a larger one with 138 kilometers. So basically, the second project is a bit more challenging because you need to have the recharging stations. I mean, you need to start the truck, charge it, and then you, have, you need to have a second charging point. But both are working very well. We don't have uh, real issues, operational issues, to be honest. And also our, our customers are happy to receive the goods, the finished goods, with these electric vehicles. But of course, if you want to expand, then it's not a, a simple question just to, to, to have a truck and uh, start in the next station and recharge. We, we discussed about this before in the previous panel. So this is where we are trying to get our attention, uh, specifically on the electric part. And, and, and co collaborate with the others because uh, there are companies that uh, they want to, to invest in the, in the electrification, but they need the volumes. And they need the companies that are interested to work in that. And, and we are trying to, to collaborate. On the other hand, if we talk about the other alternatives, we started LNG probably, yes, in this range three years ago. Today, uh, we use more than, I can certainly say, close to 150 trucks on LNG many in the first mile, so in the first uh, leg of the trip, because the major one we use tra uh, rail, and the last one also uh, electric, for instance. We don't have operational problems, to be honest, in, with, the, with the vehicles themselves. My only point related to electric is that uh, uh, the operator needs to be specialized, so the driver cannot be just a simple driver. He needs to understand how to operate and charge the truck, otherwise he's gonna die <laughs> electrocuted in, the, in, the, in, in charging. So you need to have some specialized uh, workforce for these particular vehicles, but we, we see no issues at all, to be honest, and, and we are very happy with that. We did a test, uh, many for those that are interested, we exhausted the battery of, of the electric just to see the range. 
in the first project, we have a small vehicle, so we're talking seven tons, more or less. So it's, a, it's really small. And we exhausted with 250 kilometers, just on purpose, we exhaust. The second one, I cannot speak so much because, because we have just started. We need some more experience to, to tell a bit more. But the second one, we are in the range of maximum 180, 150 kilometers, which is a heavier vehicle. But the point is, we started retrofitting. So we started working with companies that were retrofitting vehicles. And now we hope that the, the original manufacturers, uh, Scania, one of them, we will have offering the, in the market. And the next challenge is on the cost of the vehicle, right? But okay, this is, these are the subject for other discussions. But uh, I just want to, to leave my, my contact here. You can find in LinkedIn my name. If you have more specific questions, because I'm not sure if you're gonna have time for questions, but if you do, please reach me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to receive questions, and uh, if you don't have time today, I can answer later on. Well, we have 50 minutes indeed for, for the questions. So at least uh, I would exploit uh, this time for, for your interventions. Um, I, I would say that uh, um, I, I fully agree with the, with the statements coming from, uh, coming from Marcelo. Uh, it, it's important to say that, uh, uh, as, as we said, uh, we can use different solutions in different, different geographical areas. For, for instance, uh, you cannot go with an electric truck in Hungary since there are not refilling stations. Right now, for the LNG, which is liquefied methane, not coming from, uh, from biomass as liquid methane coming from fossil resources, uh, you can have it uh, in, uh, um, in, in some specific areas uh, in Europe, such as, uh, uh, such as France, uh, Spain, uh, the Italy, especially in the north of Italy, Belgium, uh, uh, Netherlands, and so on. Germany is, uh, is proceeding quite well in creating proper infrastructures, uh, but it's important to say that you cannot uh, go everywhere. So it means that you can approach different solutions for different geographical areas. Uh, well, I would uh, give the, the word to you. I will take a couple of questions and then I will ask to, to the speakers to, to reply. Um, good evening. Thank you for your discussion. And I wanted to uh, ask a couple, a couple of questions to Dr. Carri. Um, the first one is, um, since we know that uh, biofuels um, have indirect emissions due to the land usage for the growth of crops and for the use of fertilization, and also uh, the um, always limiting usage of, of uh, carbon fuels, um, on your personal opinion, which will you think that will be the percentage of uh, battery alimented um, vehicles in the transportation market and also in, um, in, in, in also the, the transportation as cars and not only trucks. And the second question is, uh, since I didn't have the possibility to read the LCA on the Beth truck, uh, I think that you also did an, uh, a life cycle cost uh, analysis on it. And my question is, which um, percentage of the budget um, comes up uh, on the investments of uh, a sustainable transactions in the next years? Well, um, f f first question was about, uh, um, can, can you repeat the first question? Sorry. Yes, of course. Um, since we know that biofuels and other, um, uh, other sources of energy as hydrogen are not really uh, that reliable. Yes, and so I, I, okay, I got a point. Um, I, I would come back honestly uh, to, the, to the concept of uh, transition because, I mean, uh, I think we do have the possibility in the long run to have more or less 100% of the application as we should never say 100%, we should never say everything, we should never say uh, nothing, but most of the application being electrified. But this will take time. As I said, in, in 10 years, we will probably be around uh, 15, 60, 50, 60% 60 
of the new vehicle sales. Um, it is exactly in this time when we really need to exploit the uh, renewable fuels, like the example of the project of, uh, of Gruber and, uh, and, uh, and many others that are starting. So uh, you're right that uh, uh, when it comes to um, uh, renewable fuels, you have to be very keen in calculating the impact uh, considering all the effects, like land use change and so on. But uh, uh, it's important, it's definitely important to, to trace the, 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 the stream of production of these fuels. And we know that there are sustainable uh, filiere. Now I really missed the, the English word. Um, and, and, this is, and this is something that is already now working well and uh, we have to use it for the transition, but it, it's also true that uh, a, a limit of this uh, alternative fuel or renewable fuel is, with many differences depending on the geography, the total availability, the total energy that we can use. So we should use them in the transition, and then we should try to electrify as much as possible with renewable energy. Second question was on LCA, right? So on, um, if you did also a life cycle costing analysis uh, that goes um, along with the yeah. life cycle analysis. Yeah, we normally uh, speak in terms of uh, TOE par parity, which is total of operating economy parity and which is a concept which is slightly different uh, compared with the uh, total cost of ownership. And uh, if we talk about electrification, the honest answer is, as we said, it is challenging today. It is challenging, it depends on many factors, some of them are technological, some others are more related to the environment, uh, like, for instance, uh, r legislation, incentive, possibility for this truck to, to drive in certain areas. Uh, that's why we, we think that uh, we should consider the, con the concept of total operating economy, not only the cost, but also the revenues. If these trucks are uh, put in the condition to, to work more because they are more sustainable, then the total operating economy will be better. And uh, as we said, it's almost on pair, depending on all these variables, with difference between the geographies today or in one year for distribution, it will be more or less in the middle of the decade if we have the right infrastructure for a longer haulage. So we definitely do this, and this will be the driver of the adoption, because after the first pioneers, the adoption of electric trucks will definitely be driven by the total operating economy. Thanks, sir. Um, another question. Uh, as I said, you can also do, do make question in, uh, in Italian. That's perfectly fine. Any other? If, yeah. Thank you for, uh, for your intervention. Um, you talk about how uh, different, the different solution will be applied to different countries. My question is more on the legal and institutional aspect on this. So uh, how strong is the connection between the private sector and the, uh, and the institutions? And specifically, how strong, like how cooperative are the policy uh, makers towards this issue and uh, the achievement of this goal? Well, I can speak uh, from my own experience, right? Because um, together with uh, Andre, we, we are part of the European Commission. In terms of policy uh, and legislation, I think we are in the right path as Europe, as a region. Uh, because you see a real uh, interest of, of people in doing the right things, right? 
uh, to me, the problem is the speed, right? Because uh, even though you have a legislation that is for the whole Europe, uh, some countries may have different speed in implementing, and we face that uh, problem, unfortunately. Uh, and, and this is probably the, 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 the speed that we need, uh, and I hope that all of the governments have the same uh, line of, of thinking if we really want to decarbonize uh, not only Europe, but the, but the whole planet. Um, I'll give a, a prob probably an example of, of, uh, of paperless. I mean, in, in some countries, the, in transportation at least, you don't deliver it with a piece of paper anymore. It's just, it's just an electronic uh, signature. And here, we're still demanding paper in, in many of, of our uh, operations. And this is something that I, I, I can personally, I cannot accept this. So to me, it's not about legislation, it's, it's about the speed. So if we can be faster, a bit faster, uh, not because we want to beat other regions or other countries, because it's the right thing to do. And I think this is what is missing in, in Europe, in, in my point of view. I'm not sure if I answer your question. Um, let me make to you an, an example uh, using uh, LNG as, uh, as an example. So LNG, as I said, is liquid, uh, liquid methane. So in that case, you have uh, a directive coming from the European Commission related to the alternative fuels. So the, the European Commission were, was basically pushing in that direction, as speaking years ago. Uh, but actually, the application of the directive was different from one place to the other ones. It means that uh, uh, Spain uh, and Italy jumped uh, immediately and going for in the direction of, uh, of the LNG. Uh, Germany was basically doing nothing, waiting for the electric. So it means that uh, in 2015, in Italy, you had just uh, one LNG refueling station. And right now, Basically, you don't have any kind of issue in the north of Italy. It's full of uh, LNG refueling stations. Uh, in Germany, since uh, a couple of years ago, th there were just one refueling station close to Berlin, if I'm not wrong. So just one. It means that basically you, you cannot use it. Uh, and right now, Germany is, uh, is running. Since uh, G electric, it, it, it's not there. It's not ready to be used. So they, they are running in order to provide... Uh, the, um, uh, the the right infrastructure for for use it. Um, Netherlands was super fine, as I said. Belgium was super fine. There is also something like uh, not related to the policymakers' point of view, but it's uh, related to the um, I would say geopolitical uh, situation, since. Uh, there's also a geopolitical reason for why, uh, from one point to the other one, Europe started to push towards the LNG, which is that uh, we need it in a way to create independence from, from the petrol. Uh, and when they started, there were, there were basically three ports accepting the LNG. Uh, there was uh, Marseille, uh, Barcelona, and, and Rotterdam. So it's quite clear why those countries were the first ones starting with the LNG. So when we approach this kind of technology, there is always uh, something like a macro-political situation that we need to take into consideration. And uh, not all the time the policymakers move in the same direction. It's clear the direction, the general direction. It means alternative fuels is clear, but as, uh, as shown with the example of the LNG, Someone is waiting for the electric, someone is uh, pushing toward the hydrogen, someone in, uh, is, uh, is, is doing directly with the LNG. Uh, Italy, as I said, uh, is running in the direction of the bio-LNG, since there is a specific uh, uh, decree which is supporting agricultural production, is producing bio-LNG. That's why we have some quantities here that uh, you cannot find in other places. Uh, but the fact is that, yeah, we are in a, in a common union, let's say, uh, but we are different countries with different mentalities. I think we still have a few minutes for another question, if there is something. Well, I guess we can uh, close uh, uh, the, the event. So thanks to everyone for, for joining us. Uh, I hope uh, uh, we have answered to some uh, of your doubts. 
but I really hope that we have also created some confusion. <laughs> Since in this framework, easy answers uh, are not probably the right ones. Thanks to everyone.